Who are your singers? A couple of classmates um, from the academy? Yeah. So from left to right, it was Abby Bangarano, and she did the high harmony. Herself in the middle uh -huh. did uh -huh. the normal alto part and then I did melody. Oh, okay. You know, you'll have to probably put the thing over here on so the spotlight can work. Yeah. Which one? Left to right. It's this side. Where is it? Yeah. You see me okay now? Better. Better? Okay. All right. Well, let's have prayer as we get into the word today. Um, Father, we ask your blessing upon the service today. Thank you for your share and love. I just tell in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Easter to everybody as we celebrate this weekend the uh, greatness of the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. All right, so now the Elliots can't ask this question because they, they, they probably already know the answer. So, so don't get so too late. I think they, they, they might know. There's a riddle we're starting today. All right, okay. Now, identify an animal. Okay. Uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's the riddle of it. Hold on, I can plug this in. Here's the first clue. This animal hates to be alone. Okay. Clue number two. It has poor eyesight, but excellent hearing. All right. Number three. If it falls on its back, it cannot get up. Someone said a turtle. No, a turtle I've seen is able to rock itself and then flip its toenail and flip itself over. All right. Definitely not a horse. No, no, Horses love rolling her back, right? Not a cat, all right? All right, all right. It's gentle. That's a good giveaway right there. Easily frightened. You know what it is now, right? Grows two teeth a year until it has eight teeth. Bet you have one at one time. Or do you have goats? If that's a sheep, that's Yes. Makes a bleeding sound. Grows eight pounds of wool a year. Did you ever have a sheep? They did not. I. Oh, you had a sheep. Oh, okay, I knew your mother had a sheep. All right, all right. Sure. And the mystery is a sheep. And of course, a baby sheep is a lamb. The lamb's important in the Bible. In the Old Testament, when you had a sin, you had to go with a lamb or an offering and give that as a sacrifice for your sins. Jesus replaced that in the New Testament with being our sacrifice. Jesus actually is described as a lamb 27 times in the book of Revelation. Here we see lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ was decided to be the Passover lamb at the foundation of the world. That's why it's called the eternal gospel. The plan of salvation has never changed. We are saved by grace through faith from eternity, and that plan was already made possible at the beginning of eternity. They already foreknew. Now, we didn't know all that, but the Bible foreknew it, and Jesus foretold it that it would happen, that he would die as our Passover lamb. Now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. How was that done? As the first sin Adam and Eve committed, their sin was put upon the lamb until Jesus Christ would come. When the Lord came, he replaced the lamb sacrifice by becoming the lamb of God for us that takes away the sins of the world. So we put our sins upon Jesus who died upon the cross and he puts upon us his grace through faith. Now, it was a very sad day. Yesterday was what day we call it, everybody. Good Friday. Why is it called Good Friday? Because that is a good day that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That was a very sad day. But I found the Lord Jesus likes to take some of the saddest heartaches that we ever have and make them joyful times. He takes the lemon in our life and adds sugar and makes a lemonade. Dare I say he takes the bitter cocoa and makes hot chocolate? He, he takes the sourness and the greatest event, the saddest day of the mankind, 
was the day that they killed Jesus, and he took that and said, I will make this the capstone by which all Christians can be seen. But at the time, it was still a sad day. The disciples were sad that Jesus was going away, and the world was sad. And of course, the, the whole family that Jesus had alive, his brothers and sisters were alive. Uh, they were sad. His mother was alive. She was sad. Sad and gloomy because Jesus had died. Oh, it, it had not been that way uh, from the start. Originally, they had such great hopes. His mother, no doubt, had a broken heart. Matthew or Mark chapter 15, 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. There were the few friends that he had that were unashamed. What was the shame connection? The disciples were hiding for fear of the Jews. Remember, Jesus was declared an enemy of the Empire of Rome. So there was not anybody that really wanted to associate with him. He was considered raising up an insurrection. He was tried and executed by the Roman law. The people that were around him were afraid they would be labeled and also suffer from his association. But he had a few people that were faithful. But earlier in the week, he was different. Earlier in the week, he entered into Jerusalem. And the Bible said that they went out and they met him with a parade of people. All the masses loved Jesus. Matthew 21, 8 through 11, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They were all so joyful. Everybody was rejoicing. It was a big event, Passover, kind of like camp meeting, where everybody comes and uh, worships. Reunions are made. People haven't seen each other for a long time. Connections are rejoined. Everybody was happy. Not quite. Who wasn't happy? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Oh, they were not happy. We don't like the Pharisees because they're not fair, you see. We like the Sadducees because they're so sad, you see. And the leaders conspired. For you see, politics had come in the church. You had two political parties. You had the Pharisees, and they believed in the resurrection, life after death, and the Sadducees did not. They were more the liberals, and you had the uh, division between them. The only thing that the two had in common was they hated each other. And Jesus now was being called the Messiah, the King, the Christ. And they hated that. They wanted him out of the picture. So they plotted and conspired to do that. Now, how did they accomplish that? Well, they had a well-laid plan. Not a good plan, but well-laid. Remember the difference in good and well? We do things well, but that doesn't mean good. The devil does evil well, doesn't he? Yeah, but it's not good. And so they had a well-laid plan that was up to no good. Part of the plan was to bribe Judas, the treasure, the whereabouts of Jesus give up Judas kiss to betray him. Part of the plan was to get lying witnesses to be lined up. And then an opportune time to get him arrested. When would be the time that they would probably want him arrested? Nighttime, right? When all the people are asleep. Not in the middle of the day because in the middle of the day the crowds loved him. So in a sneaky night they would get him uh, betrayed, arrested. Then they would get him tried and convicted. Dead, crucified, in the tomb and off the cross before the holiday began. This was only Sunday, so they acted quickly. And did they do their dastardly deed well? They did, sadly. They did it all too well. And so the sadness was that Jesus was arrested. John 18, 13, and 14. They led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised that Jesus, or the Jews, that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So they brought him in, first of all, to a religious court. The religious court really didn't have a lot of power as far as his life goes. They could disfellowship him, they could excommunicate him, 
But that was about as far as their religious court could go. But they wanted to do that first so they could discredit him and tell all the people that he was a fraud, to all the people that he was not the Christ, the Messiah. And so he first went to his religious court trial. We read about that trial, Matthew 26, 63, 64. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath of the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, that is the Christos, that is the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Jesus was no longer hiding who he was. When he'd done miracles before, he did not want that to get out because people would rise up against his movement. Now, though, when they rose in on the colt, people came out and shouted. Some rebuked, don't shout, Jesus said to them. If they don't cry and rejoice, the rocks will cry out. Remember that story? Now he was open about that he was the Christ. He told the leaders who he was. Well, they did not accept him. But the religious court was as far as they could go, so they decided to then take him to a criminal court. In a criminal court, they were under the law of Rome. They were no longer a kingdom, but they were under imperial Rome. They wanted him executed, but they could not bring an execution. So they went at night to the governor, the leader, the judge, named Pilate. And they awakened him, and they brought Jesus, brought charges. John 18, 31, Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So it wasn't enough that they found him guilty in their ecclesiastical court. They also wanted him to be found guilty in the Roman court. Not just guilty, but guilty of a felony of treason, which was answerable as an insurrectionist by death. This is what they wanted. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. So they had to come about and get some lying witnesses in a trial. So they got a, some, probably bribed them, paid the money, told them to testify and make up some lies. In order for a, 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 a pretend court to have any kind of, of hearing, you have to have a, a pretend trial. So they were the pretend prosecutors. Pilate was the pretend neutral judge. And they got some, some pretend testimony people that were liars to all make this up against him. Matthew 26, verse 60. But in the last, like, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it again in three days. Now, he was talking here about what? His own body, sure, that he would uh, lay it down and take it up again. They took these words, they misconstrued these words, they used them against him. Jesus did speak about the temple, though. The Holy Temple of the Roman Empire, Jesus had warned about the coming imminent doom. When Jesus left the temple, he told them, you see the temple? There will come a time when there will not be one stone laid upon another. Jesus was speaking of the Roman destruction. He died in 31 AD. Jerusalem would be burned and destroyed in 70 AD, about 29 years later. Jesus warned the church about that coming doom. Why were the stones torn up? There wasn't one up upon another. Well, the temple was built with gold and marble. When the fire melted the gold, it went down between the cracks of the rocks. The Roman soldiers used iron bars to pull the stones out to get the gold out from under the rocks. If you've ever seen the Wailing Wall, that is just the outside leftover of the temple that was burned in the year 70 AD. But he warned those that he loved that destruction was coming, that doom was coming, we know that Jesus warned us because we have his warning, Luke 21, 20, and 22. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, what was the clue? When you see Jerusalem, what? Surrounded by armies, then know that this desolation is near. For those in the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So when the year 70 came, the Roman Empire came into Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem was in rebellion, insurrection. They took up swords against the Roman Empire. They circled the city. What did the Christians think when they saw the Roman army around the city? They remembered that Jesus had warned them that that would happen. We're told through an early uh, church historian, and not in the Bible, but in extra writings, that when they came, not one Christian was killed. Because here's what happened. The Roman army surrounded the city, then they were with, uh, they were recalled for some reason. When they recalled the people of the city, they said, yay, Rome was afraid of us, we won. But what did the Christians say? They remember Jesus' warnings. He said, then let those who are in Judea flee to where? The mountains. Let him who is in the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. So when the Roman army withdrew, there was a short reprieve, and the Christians fled the city. They remembered that Jesus said it was going to fall. Now, the Jews there, they were upset. They said, why are you leaving? The city's safe. Rome can't harm us. And the Christians said, we believe Jesus. And so they fled, and they were okay. And Rome did come back, burn the city down, destroy the temple, and uh, destroyed everybody. Uh, and it was a sad day for the world that that happened. Now, Pilate was warned not to hurt Jesus. He had a wife who we have record of her dream that she received. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him saying, have nothing to do with this just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. You know, Pilate's big mistake, he should have listened to his wife. <laughs> he would have been much better off to say, you know what? <laughs> you guys, I don't know, did you hang wrong? Get out of my court. But he, he didn't listen to his wife. He feared the people instead. So he tried to get himself off the hook from it. He went to the crowd and asked the people, whom do you want me to release, Jesus or Barabbas? Because he feared the pastors. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they needled him. They tried to gouge him to get him to fear them. They wanted a guilty plea. They were not happy with a fair trial. The chief priest had handed him over became because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that they should uh, rather release Barabbas to them, Mark 15 says. And so they released Barabbas and Jesus was turned over to be crucified. Even though Pilate said, I find no fault with this man, they still went ahead with it. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him who you call king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him. The people turned on Jesus because they were listening to their pastors. There's a danger today when we listen to our pastors and not, not to the Bible. I tell you, we should follow the Bible, amen? amen? There's a lot of people today that just hear the pastors, the priests, and they don't open the Bible, read the Bible, and they go along with it. These people did so as well to their own destruction, to their own doom. Because of what they did, their city was destroyed, and many of them were killed. Jesus was crucified and suffered, and he gave us a blessing. Blessed are you when they insult you. When they persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Living a Christian life is not easy, is it? It's one of many challenges, sufferings, but Jesus told us to endure it. We will be rewarded someday for our faithfulness during our time. He was beaten and handed over for death. There were two kinds of beatings. One beating a person was supposed to live from and go on to go afterwards and recover and have a normal life. Then there was the beating unto death. They used special whips that had embedded in them woven objects that caused extra bleeding. Jesus received a beating unto death. This was given to those who were not supposed to survive it after they received it. 
In fact, he lost so much blood that he couldn't even walk. He, he lost the ability to carry his cross leader from the suffering that he had. Now, Pilate, even though he was the judge, and he should have given Jesus a fair trial, and he should have been honest, he put the blame off on the leaders and the people. And he publicly washes his hands of his guilt and says that I have no, no guilt in this, this matter. And Jesus then carried his cross for you and for me that day. Jesus was marched to Golgotha. It was called the place of the skull there in Israel where he was crucified. Down the Via Della Rosa. I always love that song, don't you? Down the Via Della Rosa. I know that uh, Jennifer sings that song so beautiful. She sang Jessica it in this church for Easter, huh? Jessica does also. Yeah, they both sing it. We had uh, teachers that they play and sing it for us in Ionia Church. It was very beautiful. Then they crucified Jesus. And what were his words to them? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He died for your sins and mine. We take our sins and lay them upon Jesus. As he died upon the cross, our sins have been paid for through his death. Likewise, we receive his righteousness by grace through faith. We are declared righteous through his righteous acts. Those nails paid the price of our sins. He writes our name in the Lamb's of the Life and declares us righteous by faith. Amen? Those are three points of the uh, Protestant Reformation. The Sola Scripture, the Bible of the Bible only. The priesthood of all believers, which means we go to Jesus for our sins to be forgiven. And that we remember that we are righteous by what? Grace through faith, right? Not of works or penances or indulgences or Hail Marys, or through uh, the uh, offerings of those things, but through free grace alone. And so those are the hallmark that Jesus had in his salvation. And he died that day for you, and he died for me, that our sins might be forgiven through his shed blood. During that time, there was darkness upon the land. That old spiritual song, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? There was an earthquake uh, at the resurrection, but there was an eclipse at the death on Friday. We read about it in Luke 23. That was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. What was that veil of the temple all about? That was the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place. The priest alone could go into the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. In the temple, when Jesus died, it was ripped from top to bottom, showing that it was God that did it, right? A divine act. It also showed that the earthly temple was no longer relevant. No longer were the priests their priests. Who now was our priest of the New Covenant? Jesus. It wasn't the Lamb of God that was sacrificed. No, it was now what? Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God that was sacrificed. It was no longer the earthly sanctuary system with all of its forms and rituals and rules. Now the heavenly sanctuary and heaven itself was opened up. God showed as Jesus declared, your house has left you desolate. And he declared that that week that he died on the cross. And when he died on Friday, the temple was formally ripped in half. And then, like I said, some years later, it was burned to the ground and never been rebuilt. But for the Christians, our place of worship is where? In heaven, right? In heavenly sanctuary, where Jesus is our high priest, atoning for our sins and being there. They gambled for his clothes. Then they crucified him and they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what Every man should take, Mark 15, verse 24. Very few looked upon his body. We know that John was there. Jesus said, behold your mother, take care of my mom, is what he was saying. And mom, behold your son, meaning John will take care of you because Jesus uh, needed someone to take care of his mother. His, one of his last acts was to make sure that his mom was cared for. Pilate gave up the body for burial. And there were two heroes of mine, Joseph of, of, of Arimathea and Nicodemus. 
even though the scourge of being called the treason, the traitor to Rome, even though the church leaders hated Jesus, these two brave men went and got the body of Jesus. His disciples were hiding for fear of the Jews. And we don't know a lot about uh, the funeral, but we know that Nicodemus had met with Jesus earlier. And Nicodemus loved Jesus. Amen? He believed in his kingdom. And when he saw Jesus die, his heart broke. And he went and said, can I have the body of Jesus? Can I give him a respectful funeral and a burial? Even though he might be an enemy of the state, I think he was a great savior, and I loved him dearly. Very few attended his funeral. We don't know the homily. We don't know if there's a Bible verse or a hymn that was sung. We just don't have any record of that. We do know that there was a, a grave made hastily available where never a man had been laid before. And Mary, of course, wept over her son's body. Remember when she had Jesus dedicated, the prophecy said, a sword will pierce your own soul also. This was that sword that pierced her soul because she was told by the angel that he was going to be the Messiah, the, the king. And now he was dead. How can he, my son, be the king? Was the angel wrong? Sometimes we just don't understand the war, do we? Even though the angel explained it to her, she just couldn't see that. But who could? We look back at it so clearly, but at the time it was, it was foggy. It just wasn't clear. How do you win the war by killing the king? And yet, God said, this is how I'm going to let it happen. I'm going to take the greatest injustice done and make that the capstone for which all men and women can be saved to the cross of Calvary. Oh, what a God, amen? That he is so sovereign and can do that. Well, the evil pastors came to Pilate. They remembered Jesus said he would raise in three days. So they ordered a guard and a tomb sealed and a stone rolled over it. Everyone conspired to keep him in on Friday. But you know what? Sunday was coming. Now it should have been the greatest show Sunday morning, but the eleven were hiding for fear of the Jews. People were scared. They came to bomb him, but it was too late. He had risen. An angel of the Lord he sent down from heaven, no doubt. He came and rolled back the stone from the door. Matthew 28 says, And the guards shook as for fear of him and became like dead men. And then Jesus came out and it rose from the dead. Amen. And our hope today, Easter, is that he died for our sins yesterday. He was raised for righteousness tomorrow, Easter day. Because he raised from the dead, we have the hope of seeing our dead families again. Amen. If he raised from the dead, if we die, we know we have the hope that Jesus will come again to raise us from the dead. That is the best news we have. Now, the angels were there. The women came to prepare uh, his body. Let's look real quick at Luke 23. Luke 23. And we see there, Jesus clearly gives the depiction of what, what the days of the week are. Luke 23. And then uh, notice verse 53. Then he took down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a tomb that was hewn of rock where no one had ever been laid before. And that day was the preparation day and the Sabbath drew near. So Jesus died upon Good Friday, right? The preparation day. It was called a preparation day because it was a day to prepare for the Sabbath. Now those verse 24 verse 1, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the, uh, they and certainly the women with him came and to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. So, and they did not find uh, the body of Lord Jesus. So, he rose from the dead on the first day of the week. So, what is the day in between? Between Good Friday and Sunday, we call what? Saturday, the Sabbath. That's why we know that the true Sabbath is still the, seventh, the fourth commandment, seventh day. Notice Jesus is in the grave, verse 56, chapter 20, 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So the new covenant was in effect. Jesus was dead, and they were still keeping what? The Sabbath. So the Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment, are still in effect in the new covenant. There's no question upon which day Jesus died upon, rose upon, 
And that gives us clarity as to what day the true Sabbath is, because the true Sabbath falls between the day he died, the day he rose, with the day of the true Sabbath. And that is seventh day and Saturday. That's why I keep the seventh day Sabbath. And I believe that we all should as well. Luke 24, 5 and 6, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Come and see the place where he lay. And so he rose again, and the Bible says there, Revelation 11, 15, The kingdom of this world had become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He came the first time as a babe, right? But he's going to come the second time as a king. He rode in Jerusalem riding a, a, a donkey. But he's going to come the second time riding a horse, right? Revelation 19 says, um, I'm, what do we say we should get, get his, his first name? Justice. Justice, yeah. Just white stallion, no doubt. He's calling us to be his sheep, and he's our shepherd. And we're looking for the blessing hope. The last verse. And the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2, 13. He's coming again as a righteous king, O Lord and Savior. We want to be found ready for that time. Amen? Jesus will come in soon. But may we be faithful. Thank you, Jesus, for your death upon the cross. Amen. Can we all say thank you? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your death and the resurrection. God bless you this holiday weekend.